Hello, young people and uh, younger people and older people and all of you other people. Good to see you. Um, I'm Tad. I will be here with you for the next hour. Um, let me make sure I've got everything lined up here. I think we're good. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Um, anyway, nice to see you. Nice to be back after a long and eventful last month or so of travel and COVID and inflammatory excitement. Um, when I say inflammatory, by the way, I'm not talking about people inciting riots or anything like that. I'm talking about um, <laughs> joints. And again, um, just to be clear here, the kind of joints I'm talking about are wrist joints, shoulder joints, elbow joints, all those kind. Um, I have a tendency towards issues with that, and sometimes it's worse than others, and at the moment I'm going through a stretch. And we'll just leave it at that because it's boring and it's not much fun to talk about, but it's definitely impacted uh, quite a bit of the last few weeks. Um, anyway, so what else did I want to, anyway, yeah, just I, I pretty much informed people last night, um, but I will mention it again. Yes, we went to England. We got to see some people that we wanted to see, but we didn't get to see everybody we wanted to see because probably me, I probably ran into some COVID. Um, and uh, as a result, we got sick. And uh, fortunately, we didn't spread it around too badly, but we did, we did get COVID. And um, after we came back to the Uni United States, we still were registering positive for a while after that, but then finally got rid of it. So that happened and um, we're still in the process of, you know, getting ready to move again, um, going back to the old house. Uh, so it's been a very complicated sojourn, but then again, we didn't expect all the family stuff to happen that happened and to happen in the time frame in which it happened. So that's how life is sometimes. Uh, other than that, I am just kind of, you know, waiting for publication date on um, Navigator's Children, which I don't even know what it is, um, but basically the book is done as far as I'm concerned. Um, so I, as a result, I'm working on Heirs of Ordinary Farm and The Splintered Sun, which is going to be the next um, new book, I guess. I mean, Ordinary Farm is going to be a new book in the sense that it's being written for the first time um, by Deb and I, but, but uh, in the sense of, um, you know, it's, it's the third book of a, of a, of a series, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, whereas The Splintered Sun will be the first book of what I hope will be a series of shorter novels, um, also set in Ostenard, like what we're reading tonight, which is The Witchwood Crown. Anyway, so at this point, as far as I'm concerned, um, I am uh, at least finished with this part of Ostenard, which is four long books and two short books, for those of you keeping score at home. Um, the Navigator's Children is the final brick in that particular wall. Um, but the Splintered Sun will be another Ostenard-based story, but quite different. And um, you will see why when I get it done, when I, when I have finished writing it. Um, and let me think, is there anything else that I needed to share? Not really. I mean, you know, I've just been in work mode when I can, in thinking mode when I can't, um, although that's still work, obviously. Um, so let me see just to see who is here um, and who has checked in. Uh, Jim Laubacher, hello, good to see you. Ray, good to see you too. Tiffany, welcome aboard. Um, not that you've never been here before, but just welcome. Good to see you. Angie, a pleasure as always. Who else has checked in? Jeremy, hello, Jeremy. Thinking about you. Ray, good to see you, Ray. And Sean, my friend, nice to see you too. Chris Van Dahl, Calvin Hayes, Steve Gerr, Becca Worland, Emily Bell, Claudia War, Barb Ann, Tracy McClatchy. Medardo, Medardo está aquí. Perfecto. Mr. Unangst. Jim already said hi to you. And Tiffany Christie Sanders, hello, good to see you. And Darlene Stimson, and two more who I'm going to hope are Angie and somebody else I've already said hello to because it only gives me those comments. 
So anyway, that's what's going on here in Tadtown, um, in the world of Tad. I wish there was more interesting news. Um, like I said, we're just in kind of in crazy mode. Um, for those of you just tuning in, we we moved. My my mom died last year, um, at end of the summer, beginning of the fall, and um, my dad needed a lot of help. So we spent a lot of time over here, and then he decided to move move into uh, extended care, and we moved him over there in the late winter, early spring, and then for a variety of reasons, Deb and I decided that we would move over to this house here and help take care of it and do things like that. And um, meanwhile, of course, we were back and forth over the hill all the time, and then my dad died in July, which kind of made everything suddenly uh, redundant and confusing. So we are in the process of getting ready to move back to the old house at the end of the year. So as you can imagine, I won't even show you what the office looks like. And the office is no, no less orderly than the rest of the house. Um, everything is still in boxes. There became clear, um, we'd only been here like two months when my dad died. So it became very clear there was no point in unpacking everything and finding places for everything and et cetera, et cetera. So we've just been kind of in this limbo mode for months. Um, I can't find anything because I never unpacked and I don't know where things are because we just hauled everything in when we moved. So, um, you know, every now and then people say, oh, do you have a copy of this? Or, uh, you know, can you read this or whatever? And the answer is, I have no idea where any of those things are. So that's just a quick rundown on why things are so confusing and why I sometimes look so baffled. I am baffled. I'm baffled by life um, and what's going on. And it's been a very rough year, but on the other hand, I have a really good family and uh, they've all been super supportive. And I'm, of course, including Deb and uh, my kids and Deb's family in England and everybody's been super sweet. And then you know, my, my, my immediate family, my brothers and their wives who, uh, you know, who have been great. We've all just kind of banded together to get through this tough year. So, um, you know, no complaints about that. Been very fortunate to have such good family connections. Um, and everything else though, has been a bit fraught. So anyway, that's pretty much where things are. So unless somebody has any specific questions about anything, um, which they can drop to me in the, um, oh, Sherry, I did miss you, Sherry. And Lori Wheeler checking in from Nova Scotia. All right, there, I got you guys now. Um, so anyway, um, excuse me. So unless anybody has any questions that they want to share with me um, on the, uh, social media sites on Facebook or whatever, I am going to go ahead and start reading, which seems to me like the most practical thing that I can do. So um, without further ado, then um, I am, since that's what I'm here to do, I am going to do it. I am going to read. I am reading, of course, from The Witchwood Crown. We read the foreword and the first chapter last night. So tonight I am starting on chapter two, The Finest Tent on the frost march. He had been following his father for a long time, it seemed, although he did not remember when or where they had begun. The sky had grown dark, and the familiar tall shape was only a shadow in front of him now, sometimes barely visible as the path twisted through the deepening twilight. He wished he wasn't too old to hold his father's hand, or was he? He did not know how old he was. Papa, wait, he cried. His father said something, but Morgan couldn't understand him. Something seemed to be muffling his father's voice, doors or distance or simply distraction. He hurried after, out of breath, short legs aching, trying not to notice the sounds in the trees that seemed to follow him, the strange voices hooting as softly as the ghosts of doves. Where was this place? How had they come here? So many trees. Were they in the forest of grandfather's stories, that 
that dark, unknowable place full of odd sounds and watching eyes. Papa! He raised his voice almost to a scream. Where are you? Wait for me! The trees were everywhere, and the moonlight was so faint that he could hardly see the path. As he hurried around each bend in pursuit of his father's ever-dwindling figure, the roots seemed to writhe in the mud beneath his feet, like moon-silvery snakes, grabbing at him and tripping him. Several times he stumbled and nearly fell, but forced himself on. The entire forest seemed to be twisting around him now, the trees spinning and drooping like exhausted dancers. He stopped to listen, but heard only the ghastly, breathless hoots from above. Papa, where did you go? Come back. He thought he heard his father's measured voice float back to him from somewhere far ahead, but he could not tell if he was saying, I'm here, or I fear. But fathers were never afraid. They stayed with you. They protected you. They, they weren't afraid themselves. Papa! The path was gone. He could feel the roots moving beneath his feet as the branches reached down to enfold him and smother the light. Papa, don't leave me. He was alone, abandoned and crying. He was just another orphan, a stray. Papa! No answer, never an answer. He fought to get free, but the trees still clung. It was the same every time. Morgan, prince of Erkenland, and heir to the high throne of Prester John's empire, tumbled off his cot and onto the ground, fighting with the cloak that tangled him. Half lost in the dream forest, he lay for long moments on the damp rugs, his heart thundering in his chest. At last, he sat up, trying to make sense of where he was and what had happened. He was cold even with the blanket still clinging to his neck like a spurned lover, and something nearby was making a nasty, rasping noise. Morgan peered worriedly into the darkness, but after a moment realized the sound was only the snoring of his squire, Melkin. Well, praise be to God that somebody can sleep. Memory came slouching back. He was on the royal progress with his grandfather and grandmother, he and Melkin were in his tent, in the middle of some field outside Hernes Adhark, the capital, and it was cold because spring was still a fortnight away. Tonight there had been a meal and too much talk, also too much wine, although now he was wishing he had drunk more of it, a great deal more to chase the chill from his bones, the deep, feverish body cold of another foul dream. His eyes were wet he realized. His cheeks damp. He'd been crying in his sleep. Papa, I couldn't catch up to him. There seemed to be a hole where his heart should be, as though the wind were blowing right through him. Angry, he wiped his face with his sleeve. Weeping like a child. Idiot. Coward. What if someone saw me? Wine was what he needed. Morgan knew from experience that a large cup of sour, reliable red would warm the cold hole in his vitals and push the dream out of his thoughts. But he had no wine. He had drunk all that had been offered while he dined with the king and queen, but it hadn't been enough to give him a dreamless night. For a moment, he considered simply trying to go back to sleep. The wind was blowing chill outside, and the camp was full of people who would gladly scurry to his grandparents with the tail if they saw him out staggering around at this hour of the night. But the memory of that endless forest track, of the horror of never being able to catch up to his father, was too much. Wine. Yes, it would be good to hear the foolish arguments of his friends, an ordinary, reassuring thing. And it would be even better to be drunk again, drunk enough this time that he would not hear the voices in the forest, would not feel the chill of being left behind, perhaps would not even dream. Morgan dragged himself to his feet and pushed his way out of the tent in search of accommodating oblivion. He had a good idea of where to look. 
No royal proclamation or official announcement of any kind designated the tent shared by the Nabanai knights Sir Astrian and Sir Olverus as the home of the makeshift tavern. The presence of seasoned drinker Sir Porto and a reasonably constant supply of wine was enough. The sprawling royal camp was dark, but a pair of lanterns made the tent seem nearly festive. Old Sir Porto stared down into his cup and nodded. "'Bless us when we are weak, O Lord,' he said in his most doleful tones, "'and save some blessings, if you please, because soon we will be weak again.' He took a long swallow, then wiped his damp mouth and scruffy white beard with the back of his hand. "'That is the last,' he said. God be kind what I wouldn't give for a little of that red stuff from a nestress they keep back at the maid. A man's vintage, that is. This, this grape water is scarcely old enough to know of the existence of sin. One does not need to know about sin to enjoy it, said Sir Astrian. Please, my lord, said the young woman on Astrian's lap. She was struggling, struggling hard to stand, but having no success. I will be punished if I don't get back to my work. Let me go. Astrian did not loosen his grip and kept her on his knee with small adjustments of balance. What? he demanded. Would you return to the shocking boredom of the ostler's wagons? He reached up and pulled at the girl's bodice until her bosom threatened to overspill. My lord! She snatched to hold up the fabric, and his hands, unchecked, strayed elsewhere. The tent flap jiggled but did not open. Something good-sized was caught in it, and the poles of the tent swayed as though in a gale. The air to all the lands of Ostenard appears to be tangled, said Sir Astrian. Somebody set him free and be rewarded with a sizable estate. "'I'll give you a sizable boot in your arse,' said the voice whose owner was writhing in the flap like a butterfly trying to escape its cocoon. "'As soon as I find you, someone go to our noble prince's aid. Make haste!' cried Astrian. "'I would go myself, but at the moment I am engaged in fierce battle.' He finally managed to pull down hard enough to overcome the young woman's resistance, and her bare breast sprang into view." Instead of surrendering and trying to cover herself, though, the girl redoubled her efforts to escape, cursing and flailing. The bubs, the bubs, sang Sir Astrian. The bubs, the bubs, in all the banded ring. On the day they hanged our Redeemer, though no hands did pull the cord, the bubs in every tower told to prove Adon our Lord. With help from doer black-haired Sir Olverus, Prince Morgan finally emerged from the, dent from the tent flap. Morgan's hair, a shade too brown for golden, clung in strands across his face, damp with melting snowflakes. His brows, a shade darker and thicker than his hair, rose in slow, slightly distracted dismay as he saw the serving girl fighting to free herself. God's eyes, Astrian, what are you doing? Let the poor girl go. And someone pour me a cup of something strong. He looked around. What? No succor for your lord? I call you traitors. We have finished the last, highness, said Porto, guiltily wiping his upper lip. The place is as dry as the dunes of Nascadu. God curse it! Morgan seemed genuinely upset. Nothing to drown a night of foul dreams. Oh, well, distract me then, Astrian. You owe me another game, and I'm ready to take my money back. And this time we are not using your dice, you cunning near-dwarf. Cruel words, said Astrian, grinning. The ostler's maid was still trying to get off his lap and looked ready to weep. I am not the tallest man in this kingdom, true, but I am not so low as you make me. My head reaches Olverus's neck, and since there is nothing of much use above that point, he and I are as good as even. Sweet Adon! Morgan lowered himself carefully onto a wooden stool, scowling ferociously. Are you still mauling her? I said let the girl go, Astrian. If she doesn't want to be here, let her be on her way. 
He kicked at Astrian's leg, then folded away his frown to show the wo young woman a smile made slightly less courtly by the extreme redness of, your, of his face. He begs your pardon, lass. Of course I do, my prince. Astrian released his prey just as she was straining away from him, so that she would have fallen to the ground if Olverus had not caught her and held her up until she gained her balance. The tall knight said nothing, as was his wont, but rolled his eyes at Astrian as he returned to his own seat atop a wooden chest. "'My apologies for Sir Astrian,' Morgan said to the girl. "'He is a rude fellow. And what is your name, my dear?' She was red-faced with exertion, as the prince was with drink, and her eyes were wide as a frightened horse's, but when she had pushed herself back into her bodice, she did her best to curtsy to Morgan. "'Thank you, your highness. I am Goda, and I only came here to tell these men that Lord Jeremiah said they were to have no more wine. As it is, he said, they have already drunk much of what was meant for the return journey.' Despite the angry force of her words, she was near tears. It is a good thing that there will be mead in her Nasadhark, then. Morgan waved permission for her to go. She lifted her skirts and almost ran from the tent. If they ever let us into the city, Porto's voice was doleful as a funeral bell, soon we will die of thirst here in this field. I must say, Highness, Astrian said, you look as though you've already found a bit of something to ease this sad journey. Did you bring it back to share with your brothers of the road? Share? Morgan shook his head. I had to spend the longest evening of my life at the royal table with my grandmother and grandfather, having my sins my sins and yours, that is, listed for me in ex ex exquisite detail. Then I tried to sleep, and he scowled and waved the idea away with his hand. It matters not. I deserved every drop I could guzzle, and it was still nowhere near enough, he sighed. Still, if there's nothing left to drink, we might as well gamble. With the young woman now gone, Morgan let himself slump, revealing what he truly was, a very young man who had drunk too much. "'So you bring us nothing, Highness?' asked Porto. "'I swallowed everything I could reach at my grandparents' table. "'But it wasn't enough. No, they all just kept talking. "'And it was about nothing. The bloody Hernsteri King.' and the royal blacksmith's need for a scrap to turn into horse nails, and the complaints of the local harness dairy farmers that their lands are being pillaged by the royal progress. And after putting up with that all evening, I am beginning to be sober again. I do not favor sobriety. He looked to Astrian. By the way, speaking of pillagers, I cannot help noticing a haunch of something on the spit over your fire. It looks rather like the remains of a fat farm pig. No, no, a free wild boar of the hills, Highness, Astrian said. Isn't that right, Porto? He led us a fierce chase. Porto looked more than a bit shamefaced. Oh, uh, I, he did. All over his pen, I have no doubt, Morgan frowned. God save us, the boredom. But the prince looked more haunted than bored. Oh, and there was a messenger arrived from Elvitzala, right in the middle of it all. The Rimmersmen beg us to make good speed after we leave Hernestir. It seems the duke is not dead yet. But those are excellent tidings, said Porto, sitting a little straighter. Old is Grimner still lives. Excellent news. Yes, uh, huzzah, I suppose. Morgan gave Astrian a hard look. Why are we not dicing, fellow? Why is my money still in your pocket? My lord, said Porto, I do not mean to scold, but Duke is Grimner has been one of your grandparents' greatest allies. 
I fought with him for the hayhold more than thirty years ago, and again at the cursed Nakiga Gate. You still call it fighting? Astrian smirked. I believe the name for what you did was hiding. Porto scowled. My dignity does not allow me to respond to such wretched untruths. Were you there, sir? No, you were a more mere imp of a child then, vexing your nursemaid while I was risking my life against the Norns. Astrian's loud laugh was his only reply. Porto struggled to his feet, scraping his head against the top of the tent. It was said that of all the knights who had ever fought to uphold the high ward, only the great Camaris had been taller than Porto. However, that was where the comparison ceased. What is this, then? Laughter? the old soldier demanded. Shall I call you, sir, mockery? What is this? He pulled a pendant out of his collar, a smooth female shape carved in rounded blue crystal. Did I not take this from one of the fairies after I slew him? This is Norn stuff, the true article. Go ahead, mock. You have no such prize. Sir Olverus said, I doubt not that you took it from one who was face down and dying, old man, and then you finished him off with your sword in his back. Prince Morgan jumped in surprise. By the bloody tree, Olverus, you are silent so long then you speak from the shadows without warning. I thought for a moment we were haunted. The black-haired man did not reply. He had exhausted himself with such a long speech. Enough with tormenting Porto, the prince said. Come now, Astrian. Is it to be Castor's call or Hirka? I will not let this day end without some good result, and beggaring you would make me very happy. I have not had a good day with the bones since we crossed the border into Hernestir. There are no borders out here, said Astrian, as he gave the prince's dice a good long look, weighing them on his palm, and then letting his fingers probe the pips for borer's bristles or painted lead. These will do, he said, handing them back. What do you mean by that nonsense? the prince asked. No borders. He rolled his first number. Ah, a ten, sir. Two hands. You may bid as you explain your remark. It is only this, highness, said Astrian. We crossed into Hernestir days ago. Rimmersgard is still twenty leagues away. Who do you suppose lives in Balidun? the walled city, just to the east. Morgan shrugged, watching Astrian make his point with a six and a four. Everything the knight did had a compact grace to it, most definitely including his use of a sword, where his speed and nimbleness more than made up for his small stature. He was frequently named, and not least by himself, one of the best swordsmen in any land. Hernest, dear man, I suppose, Morgan said. Knights, nobles, peasants, all the regular sorts of people. Rimmersmen, your highness. They settled there after some war hundreds of years ago and never moved again. Most of the folk there are of northern blood. Now it was Astrian's turn, and he immediately rolled stones. Bollocks, as the soldiers termed it, a pair of ones. He swept the small pot from the chest, serving as a table. I do like your dice, my prince. Now, did you notice that village we passed this morning? Not that you looked as if you were seeing much. My head was pounding and ringing like your damn Nabani bells. Yes, I suppose I saw it. Some children and others came out to wave at us, yes? Exactly. And do you know what language they speak there? No, by the eternal aid on how would I know that? They speak Hernestiri, of course. We are in Hernestir, after all, Astrian grinned. But their blood is that of Urkinland, just like yours. And there are many Urkinlandish words in their speech. Do you see? Do I see what? Morgan had lost the second throw as well, and his improved mood was beginning to fail again. 
that nobody here seems to know what language they should speak? It's bloody tree, man. How is that my concern? Because it shows that borders are nonsense, at least most of the time. There are a few, such as the boundaries between Northern Rumersgard and the Nornfels, that mean something real because they are fiercely defended on both sides. But here on the Frost March, all are mixed up together. Hernestiri, Rimersmen, Erkenlanders, the people here speak a jumble of different tongues. They remember feuds that go back hundreds of years, but they speak in a way that would make their ancestors see blood before their eyes. Do not jest about the Nornfels, said Sir Porto. You were not there at Nakiga. You did not see those things or hear them singing with voices like sweet children, even as they killed and died. I do not jest at all said Astrian. God grant the white foxes stay in the north where they belong. But the rest of the peoples of Ostenard are mixing like the wax of different colored candles, melted and swirled together. Soon there will be no difference between a Rimmer's man and a Hernestir man, or between a Nabanai lord and a Thrithing's barbarian. That is the curse of peace. Peace is no curse, said old Porto. I would love to do some deeds worthy of a prince, said Morgan sadly, as he watched another pile of coins disappear into Astrian's purse. Not a large war, perhaps, but it has been more than a score of years since we fought the Thrithings men, and I see no threat to hope for. It is a bad time to be young. Porto would say, it is never a bad time to be young, said Olveras from the back of the tent. He would also say it is never a good time to be old. I can speak for myself, sir, said the tall knight. I am not so ancient, nor so drunk, that I must be interpreted like a Naraxi island man. His face drooped a little. Nevertheless, Olveras is not wrong. Will there ever be another war? Morgan asked. Oh, I rather think so, said Astrian. Men do not manage well with too much peace. Someone will find a quarrel. I can only pray that you're right, said Morgan. <gasps> ah, look at those beauties, a pair of ale wagons. This pot is mine. He swept the coins toward him, but one slid off the chest and onto the dark ground. He got down on his knees to search for it. To be honest, Highness, I grow a little bored with dicing, said Astrian. Of course you do now that I'm beginning to win my money back. Morgan straightened up in triumph, the wayward coin in his fist. What else have we to do in any case? It must be rising midnight and you told me that the wine is all gone. Perhaps, said Astrian. Perhaps, Morgan grimaced, anything but yes has an ugly sound, for I could happily drink more. Sir Porto stirred. I marvel at your stomach, young master. It must be from your mother's side. Your late father, I recall, never drank anything stronger than the weakest, most watered wine. His eyes widened in distress. Oh, Highness, forgive me. I forgot what day it is. Fool, said Olverus. Morgan shook his head as though in anger, but said, Don't chide, old Porto. What should I care? The dead are dead. It does no good to think on them too much. Porto still looked shaken, but now a little surprised as well. Oh, but, but I'm, I'm sure he watches you from heaven, Prince Morgan. If it were me, he fell silent, caught up by a sudden thought of his own. Only you could so deftly crush a conversation, ancient fool, Astrian told him. We speak of wine, then you chime in with death and heaven, the two foes, chief foes of a man's drinking pleasure. Morgan shook his head again. I said leave him be, both of you. 
If my father is watching over me, it would be the first time. No, truly, I will tell you a story. Once when I was but young, I went to his chambers to tell him I had saddled and rode my horse all by myself. When he came to the door, he said, I must tell my master he was not to be disturbed. I, I do not understand, said Porto, frowning. He thought I was some page boy sent by Count Ailer. Morgan smiled at the joke, but did not, did not seem to find it truly funny. Perhaps he had the sun in his eyes, Porto said. I am all but blind when the sun shines in my face. It wasn't the first time he did not know his own son, nor the last. Morgan looked down for a moment, then turned to Astrian. We were talking about wine. Why? Do we have some left, after all? Sir Astrian smiled. As it happens, a few local girls we met promised they would meet us tonight in the birch grove at the edge of the field. I told them if they brought wine, they might even meet the true prince of all Ostenard. For a moment, Morgan brightened, but then an unhappy shadow passed over his face. I can't do it, Astrian. My grandparents want to be ready to ride into Hernes Adhark tomorrow morning, as soon as the invitation is received. They told me to be in my tent by the end of the second watch. They want you rested, am I not right? So you may present yourself to the Hernestiri as befits a prince? I suppose. Then what do you think would be better, to go sourly and soberly to bed, after I have finished taking more money from you, or to have an enjoyable time with some local wenches, and to wet your dry throat enough to allow you a happy, peaceful sleep. Morgan laughed, despite himself. By God, you could argue the ransomer down off the holy tree, Astrian. Well, perhaps I will go along for a little while, then. But you must promise to help me get back to the royal tents. My grandfather is already furious with me. He made a face. He had adventures. He slew dragons. But what does he expect of me? Endless, horrid ceremonies. Sitting still all day while fools drone on about justice and taxes and hides of land like the buzzing of bees on a hot day. It's enough to send anyone to sleep, whether they've drunk any wine or not. He stood, brushing the worst of the dry grass and dirt from his clothes, although it was hard to tell by lamplight whether he had improved his appearance much. The sleeve of his jerkin had a woeful tatter, and the knees of his hose were both now damp and darkened with mud. Alvarez, Porto, are you coming? Alvarez appeared suddenly from the shadows like something lifted from a box. Porto only shook his head. I, I am too old for this foolishness night after night, he said. I will remain here and think about my soul. That is the part of you least worth exercising, old man. Astrian rose and stretched. And now, Highness, if you'll follow me, I believe some ladies await us. It amazes me how such a short fellow cut such a figure with the women, the prince said, looking on his friend with more than a little pride. Hmm? said Olverus, looking down at the prince, who is in truth less than a hand span taller than Sir Astrian. I see two short fellows. Silence, beanpole, said Morgan. There is no need for amazement, Highness, Astrian was grinning. As with swordplay, the weapon must only be well employed and long enough to reach its target. He made a mocking bow and swaggered out, pointedly leaving Prince Morgan and Sir Alvarez to follow him. After they had gone, Porto rose with a series of pained grunts and began to look around, in case someone had left something to drink. After long moments of fruitless search, he sighed and followed his comrades out between the tents and toward the distant birch grove.
The prince knew he had waved to the guard standing watch. That much was certain. Everything had been fine up until then. But now he seemed caught like a fish in a net, and it had happened quite by surprise. He was having a particularly difficult time with tent flaps today. That much, at least, was beyond argument. Morgan pawed at the heavy cloth, turning, trying to find the edge. No luck. He took another step forward, but now there seemed to be fabric on both sides of him. What madman would make a tent with two flaps? And when had they substituted it for the perfectly good tent he'd already had? The prince cursed and pawed again, then picked up as much of the flap as he could reach and lifted it, staggering forward with the weight of the heavy fabric on his head and shoulders. The stars appeared above him. For just a brief moment, he wondered why there were stars inside his tent, but then realized that he had somehow worked his way back outside. He had an overwhelming need to piss, so he undid his breeks and sent forth a mighty stream. He watched it feather in the stiff breeze until it dwindled and died. He decided he should try the flap again. Oh, yes, I have been drinking. It explained a great deal. This time he solved the puzzle after only a short interval of grunting and fumbling and made it two steps into the tent before he smashed his shin against some obstacle. The pain was so fierce that he was still hopping on one foot, swearing like a Merriman river man, when somebody flipped open a hooded lantern bathing the interior of the tent in light. Where have you been? demanded his grandmother, the queen. Morgan almost fell down before remembering two feet on the ground made for better balance. The shock of the sudden light and Queen Miriamel's voice had not yet passed when she added, And what are you thinking, child? Fasten your clothes, please. He scrabbled to pull his breeks closed. Drink had made his fingers as clumsy as raw sausages. I, Majesty, I, oh, for the love of all that is good, sit down before you trip on something else and kill yourself. He sank onto the chest that had so recently and cruelly attacked him. His shin still throbbed. A am I? Is this? I thought... Yes, you young fool, this is your tent. I was waiting for you. God, you are stinking drunk. And stinking is the word. He tried to smile, but it didn't feel like he was getting it right. Not my fault. Astrin. Astrid challenged Baron Colfer's men to contest. For a long time, Morgan had thought that the man he was matching cup for cup was Baron Colfer himself. He had been surprised that the Baron was so young and so muscular, and that he had the holy tree tattooed on his forehead. It hadn't been until Morgan had fallen to his knees vomiting, and the Baron's men had been cheering loudly for someone called Ox, that he had realized the Baron himself was not present. He wouldn't have felt so bad at this moment if he had managed to win. That would have made the scolding worthwhile. You have no idea how lucky you are that it was me waiting for you, not your grandfather. He already thinks you are becoming an embarrassment. I'm not an, I'm not an, embarrass, I'm not an embarrassment. I'm a prince. His grandmother rolled her eyes to the heavens. Oh, spare me. Is this what a prince does to honor the day of his father's birth? Drinks until the morning hours, stumbles back in half-dressed, smelling of vomit and cheap sachet. Could you not at least spend your time with women who can afford a decent pomander? You stink like the end of market day. Yes, there had been a few girls. He remembered that now he and Astrian had been walking them back to their village for their protection. Olverus was off protecting an older woman he'd met. But then things had become a bit confusing as the walk turned into a game of hide and seek. Then there had been wet grass. 
Somebody had been named Sofra, he thought, a very friendly someone. After that, he had been back in camp trying to get past the demon tent flap, waiting for his lazy squire to wake up and help him, which reminded him, Where's Melkin? If you mean your squire, I sent him out a short while ago to get me a blanket, a clean blanket. I didn't expect to be waiting so long, and I was getting cold. She sounded very, very unhappy. Please, Majesty, Grandmother, I know you're angry, but I, I can explain. Queen Mariamel rose. There is nothing to explain, Morgan. There is nothing interesting or unusual about anything you have been doing, except for the fact that you are heir to the high throne. She moved to the tent flap. We will only be a day or two in Hernus Adhark, where the people are already whispering about you and your friends, I am told. Then we must travel to Elvertshala, in Rimmer's Guard, to say farewell to one of the finest men your grandfather and I have ever known. You will not simply be a visitor there. You will be all they will see and remember for years of the man who will one day lead them, the man to whom even the King of Ernestir and the Duke of Rimmersgard must kneel. Will you make yourself an ugly joke as you have done in Urchester and all during this journey? Will you earn the people's loyalty or their scorn? She flipped shut the hood on the lantern, leaving only her voice to share the dark intent with him. We leave early tomorrow. Is Grimner still lives, but for how long, no one knows. You will be on your horse at first light. If you are timely and presentable, I will not tell your grandfather about this. Remember, first light. Morgan groaned despite himself. Too early, why so early? He tried to remember what Astrian had said, because it had made sense at the time. I only drank wine so I could sleep better and not... I mean, so I could be a good prince, a better prince. There was a long silence. The queen's voice was cold as a blade. Your grandfather and I are tired of this foolishness, Morgan. Very, very tired. The queen seemed to have no trouble with the flap, passing through and out into the night without a sound. Morgan sat on the chest in darkness and wondered why things were always so much easier for everyone else. Chapter 3 Conversation with a Corpse Giant. This, by the way, is one of the first sections of this book that actually existed before the book. This is talking about chapter three. Um, some of you may remember way back when I had a project, um, which I may still do a version of someday, which was tentatively titled by Deb Chronicles in Stone, or A Chronicle in Stone, which was going to be in the near present of Ostenard and about um, an archaeological expedition to the uh, site of what had been the Hayholt and was going to have a lot of stories in it based on uh, artifacts. So anyway, at the time, I had been, this was before I thought of writing uh, The Last King of Ostenard. So at the time, I had been thinking of short stories. And one of them you've seen a little bit of already, which had to do with Simon and um, the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The bard, the harper, um, and the difference between truth and um, songs and legends. And another one was this one of Jarnulf, Jarnulf um, meeting with a corpse giant. And those were two of the early stories that were going to exist by themselves. So they got folded into the book um, many years later when I actually started uh, The Witchwood Crown. So anyway, just a bit of a side there in terms of um, some history. Chapter three, conversation with a corpse giant. The waxing moon was nearly full, but curtained 
by thick clouds, as were the stars. It was not hard for Jarnulf to imagine that he was floating in the high darkness where only God lived, like a confessor priest in his blind box, listening all day long to the sins of mankind. But God, he thought, did not have that corpse smell in his nostrils every moment. Or did he? For if my lord doesn't like the scent of death, Jarnulf wondered, why does he make so many dead men? Jarnulf looked to the corpse stretched at the side of the tree burial platform nearest the trunk. It was an old woman, or had been, her hands gnarled like tree roots by years of hard work, her body covered only by a thin blanket as though for a summer night's sleep instead of eternity. Her jaw was bound shut, and snow had pooled in the sockets of her eyes, giving her a look of infinite blind blankness. Here, in the far north of Rimmersgard, they might worship at the altar of the new god and his son, Eusiris Adon, but they honored the old gods and old ways as well. The corpse wore thick birch bark shoes, which showed she had been dressed not for a triumphal appearance in Eusiris the Ransomer's heavenly court, but for the long walk through the cold, silent land of the dead. It seemed barbaric to leave a body to scavengers and the elements, but the Rimmer's folk who lived beside this ancient forest considered it as natural as the Southerners setting their dead in little houses of stone or burying them in holes. But it was not the local customs that interested Jarnulf, or even what waited for the dead woman's soul in the afterlife, but the scavengers who had come to the corpse, one sort in particular. The wind strengthened and set clouds flowing through the black sky, the treetop swaying. The platform on which Jarnulf sat thirty cubits above the icy ground rocked like a small boat on rough seas. He pulled his cloak tighter and waited. He heard it before he could see anything, a swish of branches out of time with the rise and fall of the wind's noises. The scent came to him a few moments later, and although the corpse lying at the far end of the platform had an odor of its own, it seemed almost healthy to Jarnulf, matched against this new stink. He was almost grateful when the wind changed direction, although for a moment it left him with no way of judging the approach of the thing he had been waiting for since the dark northern afternoon had ended. Now he saw it, or at least part of it, a gleam of long, pale limbs in the nearby treetops. As he had hoped, it was a corpse giant, a huna, too small or too old to hunt successfully, and thus reduced to preying on carcasses, both animal and human. The sinking moon still spread enough light to show the creature's long legs flexing and extending as it clambered toward him through the treetops like a huge white spider. Jarnulf took a slow, deep breath and wondered again whether he would regret leaving his bow and quiver down below, but carrying them would have made the climb more difficult, and even several arrows would not kill a giant quickly enough to be much use on such a dangerously constrained battlefield, especially when his task was not to kill the creature, but to get answers from it. He was frightened, of course. Anyone who was not a madman would be. So he said the monk's night prayer, which had been one of father's favorites. Adon to my right hand, Adon to my left, Adon before me, Adon behind me, Adon in the wind and rain that fall upon me, Adon in the sun and moon that light my way, Adon in every eye that beholds me and every ear that hears me, Adon in every mouth that speaks of me, in every heart that loves me. Ransomer, go with me where I travel. Ransomer, lead me where I should go. Ransomer, give me the blessings of your presence as I give my life to you. As Jarnall finished his silent recitation, the pale monstrosity vanished from the nearest tree beneath the edge of the platform. A moment later, he felt the entire wooden floor dip beneath him as the creature pulled itself up from below. First, its hands appeared, knob-knuckled and black-clawed, each big as a serving platter. 
then the head, a white lump that rose until light glinted from the twin moons of its eyes. For all its fearsomeness, Jarnulf thought the monster looked like something put together hurriedly, its elbows and knees and hairy limbs sticking out at strange angles. It moved cautiously as it pulled itself up onto the platform, the timbers barely creaking beneath its great weight. Its foxfire eyes never left the dead woman at the far end of the wooden stand. Jarnulf had seen many giants, had even fought a few and survived, but the superstitious horror never entirely went away. The beast's shaggy, powerful limbs were far longer than his own, but it was old and smaller than most of its kind. In fact, only the giant's legs and arms were full-sized. Its shrunken body and head seemed to dangle between them, like those of some hairy crab or long-legged insect. The Nyarhuna's fur was patchy, too. Even by moonlight, Jarnulf could see that its once snowy pelt was mottled with age. But, though the beast might be old, he reminded himself, it was still easily capable of killing even a strong man. If those grotesque, clawed hands got a grip on him, they would tear him apart in an instant. The giant was making its way across the platform toward the corpse, when Jarnulf spoke suddenly and loudly. What do you think you are doing, Nightwalker? By what right do you disturb the dead? The monster flinched in alarm, and Jarnulf saw its leg muscles bunch in preparation for sudden movement, either battle or escape. Do not move, Corpse Eater, he warned in the Hikadaya tongue, wondering if it could understand him, let alone reply. I am behind you, Move too quickly for my liking, and you will have my spear through your heart. But know this, if I wanted you dead, godless creature, you would be dead already. All I want is talk. You might talk. The giant's voice was nothing manlike, more like the rasping of a popinjay from the southern islands, but so deep that Jarnulf could feel it in his ribs and belly. Clearly, though, the stories had been true. Some of the older Hunan could indeed use and understand words, which meant that the terrible risk he was taking had not been completely in vain. Yes, turn around, monster. Face me. Jarnulf couched the butt of his spear between two of the bound logs that formed the platform, then balanced it so that the leaf-shaped spearhead pointed toward the giant's heart like a lodestone. I know you are thinking you might swing down and escape before I can hurt you badly, but if you do, you will never hear my bargain, and you will also likely not eat tonight. Are you by any chance hungry? The thing crouched in a jutting tangle of its own arms and legs like some horribly malformed beggar, and stared at Jarnulf with eyes bright and baleful. The giant's face was cracked and seemed like old leather, its skin much darker than its fur. The monster was indeed old, that was obvious in its every stiff movement and in the pendulous swing of its belly, but the narrowed eyes and mostly unbroken fangs warned that it was still dangerous. Hungry? It growled. Jarnulf gestured at the corpse. Answer my questions, then you can have your meal. The thing looked at him with squinting mistrust. Not your... This? No, this old woman is not my grandmother or my great-grandmother. I do not even know her name, but I saw her people carry her up here, and I heard them talking. I know that you and your kind have been raiding tree burials all over this part of Rimmersgard, although your own lands are leagues away in the north. The question is, why? The giant stared fixedly at the spear point where it stood a few yards from its hairy chest. I tell what you want, then you kill. Not talk that way. No spear. 
Jarnulf slowly lowered the spear to the platform, setting it down well out of even the giant's long reach, but kept his hand close to it. There. Speak, devil spawn. I'm waiting for you to tell me why. Why? What? Man, it growled. Why your kind are suddenly roaming in Rimmersgard again, and so far south? Lands you were scourged from generations ago. What calamity has driven your evil breed down out of the Nornfells? The corpse giant watched Jarnulf as carefully as it had watched the spear point, its breath rasping in and out. What is calamity? The giant asked at last. Bad times. Tell me why are you here? Why have your kind begun to hunt again in the lands of men? And why are the oldest and sickliest Hunan, like you, stealing the mortal dead for your meals? I want to know the answer. Do you understand me? And I think I'm going to stop there. Yeah, I think that's probably the best choice. Sorry to be so sudden and abrupt. Um, it just occurred to me that there's several more pages of this left. And no good and easy place to stop there. So, I'm going to stop there. So then, all right, let's see if we've got... Things still going. Bum, 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 bum. Okay. Um, so with that, I am going to wrap it up for the night. I will be back next week. Um, I'm guessing. Although, you know, maybe a corpse giant would be a good thing to read on Halloween. Um, around Halloween. Near Halloween. Since it will be the Sunday before Halloween. Anyway, I'll figure it out as I go. It depends on if I find a story I want to read or what. Um, I don't think I have any of my own scarier stories left that I haven't read. I've read you guys most of the short stories over the years that we've been doing this. But anyway, I'll have a look and see. I'll look and see if there's anything else, if I've got anything else. Unfortunately, as I said, almost all my books are packed away, which makes it very hard to find things to read. But we'll figure it out. So with that, I am going to say thank you for joining me. A pleasure as always to spend time with you. I hope it was a pleasure on your end as well. Um, Back next week, as I mentioned, one way or the other, same times, uh, 1 a.m. and 7 p.m. Sunday. Um, and I'm saying um a lot. And uh, that's about it. So until we meet up again, take good care of yourselves. Take good care of your friends and loved ones and neighbors. We will all help to take care of each other. That is the only way we are going to get through this thing um, with any, any chance of success. So for me... And everything on this end, I say be well and peace. And I'll talk to you soon. Okay, good night, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be.